thanks to all of you for joining us too. Um, we're focusing on growing pollinator friendly flowers and more. Um, I wanna start off with a quick word about the Xerces Society. Um, if you're here, you probably know a little bit about us, but just in case you're new, we're a nonprofit conservation organization and we work to protect invertebrates and their habitat. And we have been around for over 50 years now, which is really exciting. We have um, different approaches to conservation. We approach it through education and outreach, through habitat restoration, through community science, as well as research. So we have experience across a wide variety of landscapes and really have um, been pretty successful in these multi-pronged approaches to trying um, to protect invertebrates through multiple methods. Our main office is in Portland, Oregon, um, but we have a number of regional offices as well. We have remote staff in 23 different states um, and then multiple staff in some of those states. I'm based in Omaha, Nebraska. And at Xerces, we focus on invertebrates because they are the little things that help run the world. <laughs> they contribute to soil health, uh, by recycling nutrients, they contribute to water quality, they help control ornamental and crop pests, they provide food for other wildlife, and they help plants reproduce as pollinators. Our key groups of insect pollinators are butterflies, flies, wasps, moths, beetles, and bees. And all of these pollinators are are um, really needed for wild plant pollination and as well as, as crop pollination. Pollinators are at the heart of, health, of healthy ecosystems. Their work provides food and shelter for all sorts of wildlife. Um, and pollinators are also really important to our health. They contribute significantly to crop production and um, the food that provides us with crucial nutrients that we can't get through other sources. So a diverse community of pollinators is, um, as I mentioned, really important in crop pollination as well as to wild plant communities. Um, but unfortunately, pollinators are experiencing alarming and rapid declines. Um, for example, about 18% of butterfly species and 28% of bumblebee, bumblebee species in the United States face some degree of extinction risk. Um, another way to think about it is that in every single one of our 50 states in the United States, there's at least one imperiled pollinator species that face a degree of extinction risk. And about 40 or 50 years ago, the biologist Paul Ehrlich was looking for an analogy to describe the importance of biodiversity and landed on um, likening it to an airplane. If you're sitting in an airplane looking out at through the window at the wing, you might notice there are a couple rivets missing that are holding the wings together, but you're not too concerned because there are plenty of other rivets. So losing a few may not make a difference overall on the ability of the airplane to fly. But at some point when you lose a critical rivet, um, a crash becomes inevitable. And for so long, we really assumed that systems, either natural or agricultural, are robust enough so that they can withstand the losses of a few species or even more than a few. We, we've just been hopeful that that's been the case really. Um, but in, when it comes to pollinators, um, there is some evidence to suggest that even losing one species out of a, of a of community of pollinators can change the dynamics so that plant reproduction is impacted and even ecosystem functioning. Some of the drivers of pollinator declines include habitat loss, um, particular to intensive farming as well as suburban development. Um, the use of pesticides, particularly insecticides. The climate crisis that alters habitat and changes resource availability. Um, invasive species that are really changing plant communities across our landscapes. And pathogens and disease that are spread by um, honeybees and commercial bumblebee colonies. So with all these different drivers, and ways that we are impacting our lands, we're really making a lot of our spaces hostile to pollinators. And pollinator declines are also happening alongside declines in other insects too. And anecdotally, this has been known as the windshield effect. Maybe you've noticed it too as you've been driving that these days there are just fewer insects that hit your windshield. You don't need to stop every few hours 
at a gas station, wipe off your windshield in order to see the way you might have needed to do 15, 20 years ago. Um, but it isn't just anecdotal. There's plenty of data from studies around the world to, to demonstrate that insects are in decline, um, both in biomass and in species. So where do we go from here? Um, research also indicates and demonstrates that habitat is really key to restoring insect and pollinator communities. If you build it, pollinators will come. Um, habitat can help pollinators be more resilient in the face of climate change, and it can boost their immune system response to pathogens and insecticides. So it's really, really important to protect all the existing habitat that we have, but it's also really important to add additional habitat in the landscape, restoring habitat on roadsides, under utility rights of way, um, on brown fields, at corporate buildings and golf courses, parks, and so forth. Every opportunity that we have, it's important to add habitat back into our landscape to support pollinators. And gardens can also be important. Here is just a subset of the research titles that um, of studies that link gardens and urban plantings to pollinator health. Um, and so today we're really focusing on um, bringing back flowering plants for pollinators in our own spaces and in our communities. And our goals for today are to understand how gardens can benefit pollinators and become more familiar with ways to add flowering plants to your landscape and how to select plants and install them for pollinators. And then lastly, to talk just briefly about what you can do beyond your space to help pollinators. Um, to start, what is habitat for pollinators? Um, no matter the skill that you are working with, whether it's a terrace with potted plants or you have acres and acres of land, pollinators really need three elements. They need food, shelter, and safe haven from pesticides. And this is really the backbone of our Bring Back the Pollinators program. Um, food for pollinators is flowering plants that provide pollen and nectar for the adults, um, as well as host plants for caterpillars of butterflies and moths. And then shelter for pollinators is overwintering sites for um, butterflies and moths and beetles and wasps and um, flies, which can be something like bunch grasses or piles of leaves. And for bees, it's in some wasps, it's nest in the ground or in plant stems. So that's healthy pollinator habitat. And to keep it healthy, you need to protect it from pesticides. So, how do gardens help pollinators? Um, and unlike many animals that are in need of conservation, pollinators, many pollinators anyway, can use small spaces. They don't need um, 10 acres of habitat like some large mammals might need. Gardens can provide them with the food that they need and the shelter that they need to survive um, if they're protected from pesticides. So pollinator communities can be in fact really diverse in cities and in urban gardens. Um, just one quick example, a study in Munich, Germany found that one-year-old flower strips uh, attracted one-third of all the bee species found in the city. And after one year, you could bring back one-third of the pollinators, of, of bees anyway. That's really quick turnaround time, so pretty incredible results. And it isn't just common species that you can support in gardens, you can support rare species as well. Um, the bee on the left here is the rusty patch bumblebee. It's the first bee to be federally listed under the Endangered Species Act uh, in the lower 48 states. And has new populations of this bee have recently been found in um, urban and suburban uh, lands in Wisconsin and Minnesota. So gardens in those spaces are really important for this bee. And on the right, this is Andrina cerebrata, a really small minor bee. Uh, it's so rare that we really don't know very much about it, uh, but it has only been found in uh, um, yards in Webster Grove, Missouri, outside of St. Louis. <laughs> and, you know, just to take a moment and reflect a little bit about gardening, for me, it's the way that um, I use to make change happen on a small scale. I really enjoy the process of adding plants to the landscape and watching new animals find those plants. And I also really love showing my kids that ha habitat and wildlife 
can be everywhere. Um, not, it's not something you go to, it's something that's a part of your life. Um, it's also just a really important component of my own mental health too. So although um, I definitely look at gardening for pollinators as giving back to them, a, a huge component of that is also fairly selfish where I'm reaping a lot of the rewards too. All right, so let's move into talking about how we can grow more plants for pollinators. So we can add flowers to landscapes in a lot of different places. Um, for example, in food gardens, if you are growing fruits and vegetables or herbs in your space, um, some of those plants you can let flower and provide pollinators with um, pollen and nectar. So pictured here is basil, that's a really attractive um, flower for many pollinators when it is allowed to go to flower. Oregano, rosemary, dill, many other herbs are also attractive to pollinators. If you have a balcony or a terrace, you can grow plants for pollinators in containers. And these can be plants that provide pollen and nectar, um, but it can also be food for caterpillars. Caterpillars can complete their life cycle in a plant that you can grow in a container. Um, and some small solitary ground nesting bees will use flower pots to nest in as well. Um, pollinators can use small spaces. So you can make an impact even if we were working with small containers. Community gardens are also really good places to add more plants for pollinators. Um, this can be food plants like berry shrubs or fruit trees like apple or peach or plum. Um, or it can be uh, wild plants on the picture on the left here. This is a community garden in Philadelphia where people in the community are installing one of our pollinator habitat kits to grow more perennial wildflowers for pollinators. Um, home gardens, flower beds are a very clear opportunity for pollinator habitat. And you could also scale that up to converting your entire lawn to pollinator habitat as well. It's really important to note that turf grass lawns are not habitat for much of anything. They don't support pollinators, they don't support birds. Really the only species that they're good for are Japanese beetles and other lawn pests. <laughs> so um, other downsides of turf are that they do require a lot of input. You know, they require water, sometimes they require fertilizer and definitely regular mowing. Um, so reducing the amount of lawn in your space can have advantages to your own time and your maintenance practices, but also make your yard more pollinator friendly. All right, so there are three main stages of um, growing plants, plants for pollinators. Um, to start off with, you wanna start with planning and then follow it up with installation and maintenance. And before you dig, planning is really crucial to help you assess your conditions, think about how you're gonna use the space select the plants you need for that space and then um, design the space. And then you're able to prepare for the site and install those plants and then reap the benefits. So the first step in planning is to look at the conditions of your site um, and your space, specifically the sun exposure, the soil type and your moisture levels. So it can be really good when you're considering to go out, take a look at your space and sketch out on a piece of paper the light levels. If you're working in a yard, for example, um, map out your yard and map out where you have areas that are full sun, which is six or six or more hours a day, um, partial sun and full shade. Then next, you can determine your soil type and you could send in a sample of your soil to local extension or a soil testing laboratory. This could be important if you want to know more about your pH or if you're concerned about habitat or excuse me, soil contaminants. Um, where I live in Omaha, it's on the edge of a Superfund site. <laughs> um, we have, as part of the history of Omaha, there was a smelting um, plant that distributed lead over a good portion of the city. So there's lead contamination in soil. And so before planting, it was really important to assess the, lev the lead levels. But if you don't need to worry about your pH or you're not concerned about contaminants, um, it can be as easy as picking up a clump of soil in your hand to figure out your soil type. Um, if, you're, if you've got clay, you'll hold it together and mush it together. It's sticky. You can squeeze it, roll it into um, a ball or roll it into a little snake. 
and that's when you know you've got clay soil. If you've got sandy soil, you'll pick it up. It'll start to um, trickle through your fingers really easily. It'll be dry and fairly gritty. And then loam is the happy medium between those two types. Lastly, you want to check your site for topography and drainage. So you're going to look for places where um, water might pool, where there's lots of moisture, or slopes that are more dry. So if you've got an area where a downspout empties out, and it's concave, um, that's a good place to put plants that do really well in light conditions. Or if you've got a slope that faces south, that's a great place to do to plant plants that do really do really well in dry conditions. So knowing all of these conditions ultimately will help you match the plants to where they would grow more naturally, and that will help them be resilient and grow successfully. Um, there's this old gardener's phrase that you want to put the right plant in the right place, and that's really just about matching plants to the site conditions so that they can be successful. Um, I personally have been try I have tried to be optimistic about plant placement and sometimes have experimented with putting full sun plants in partial shade. <laughs> and that really just doesn't work. So don't, don't do that. Um, it's good to, to know what you're working with. Next in planning is to think through how you are currently using that space and how you want to use it in the future. And this can help you visualize where you want to place plants um, and also consider the types of plants that you want to consider. Do you want shorter plants? Do you want taller plants? Um, and so forth. So in the picture on the left here, this is a really shady area underneath a really giant, beautiful black locust tree. We spend a lot of time in the summer under that tree because it's shady and cooler. So we play a lot in that area. So um, it was really important to locate our garden plants outside of that space. And then in the area on the right, the picture on the right, um, we did a lot of consideration about the height of plants to try to keep them fairly short because it's along um, the sidewalk up to the house. But we didn't really think carefully about the width and how those plants would spread over time, especially in soil when they don't have a lot of other competition, native plants can do really well. So it's it's important to think about placement in terms of um, what, you, what you want it to look like in the long term. The next step in planning is thinking through plant selection. And of course, knowing the conditions of sun, soil, and moisture are really key in helping you select species of plants to do well in your space. But there are also some additional considerations to layer on top. Um, and in particular, this particular, and in particular, that can be um, prioritizing native plants. Um, there are some non-native plants that are, are can really great for supporting pollinators, uh, but today I'm really choosing to focus on native plants because many of the non-native plants out there are already very familiar to many of you, and are also incredibly prevalent at garden stores. And it is incredibly important to prioritize native plants, especially when it comes to pollinators because some native plants support more numbers of pollinator species and greater abundances of pollinators. Pollinators will certainly visit non-native plants, but they prefer native plants for pollen and nectar sources. And some require native plants for pollen and nectar sources as well as host plants. Um, and in fact, native plants can support many more species of caterpillars many more um, biomass of caterpillars than non-native plants do. And that has um, trickle up effects to the food web. So in um, suburban communities where you have non-native trees, you have fewer birds because those non-native trees support fewer insects. And birds really rely on insects like caterpillars as key food sources for their young. Native plants are also adapted to the rainfall conditions, um, the temperature, the soil, and this makes them really well equipped to survive stresses like drought or really severe winters, um, and definitely poor soil conditions without additional care from you and additional input. Um, this is an illustration of the root systems of some native plants, and on the far left, this little um, box over there, it represents Kentucky bluegrass. They have very short root systems, just maybe an inch or two. Um, native plants in the contrast can extend much, much further into the soil. And that can um, help, that's 
largely why they have so many ecological benefits. Their root systems help in water infiltrate deeper, they improve soil health, they make native plants more resistant to plant invasion, they help them um, survive flooding and droughts and other extreme weather as well. But just beyond all these ecological benefits, it's really fun um, to add native plants to your space because they do attract so much more life. Um, so it's really fun to see the life that comes to that space. And it's also fun to watch other people, um, maybe neighbors, for example, enjoy the life when that, when that comes to. So these native landscapes are a way to keep us connected to nature and all the resources it provides. And it's a rewarding way that we can give habitats back to animals and plants. There are native plants for all sorts of conditions, soil conditions, dry conditions, shady, sunny, and so forth. So there's a lot of different ways to integrate them into different spaces within, um, within cities, within towns, um, within yards, or in containers as well. So um, when selecting native plants, there are cultivars out there. These are plants, native plant species that have been bred um, for a particular purpose, whether it, in many cases available at nurseries, it's, they've been bred for showiness. Um, it's important to prioritize straight natives whenever possible, wild types of these native plants whenever possible over these cultivars, um, because some of, some of these cultivars through the breeding process have um, lost the ability to produce nectar or pollen, um, or it might be difficult for the the pollinator to reach the nectar and pollen, depending on how that flower looks now through the breeding process. In some cases, the cultivar might be equally as useful for pollinators as the wild type, but it is difficult to know. So um, to be on the safe side, prioritize straight natives whenever possible. And um, different pollinators are out at different times in the growing season. Some species have life cycles that extend throughout from spring to fall, like bumblebees, for example, You've got queen bumblebees out in the spring and workers out in the summer and males towards the end of summer and then queens again out in the fall. Um, and in other species, you've got um, just a short flight period, three weeks or, or more, maybe a little bit less. Um, and so for this reason, you need to have blooming plants available um, and hopefully overlapping bloom times so that you've got something constantly blooming from spring to fall. So um, this means including trees and shrubs as well as wildflowers to, to meet those bloom gaps. An additional consideration when selecting plants are to support the needs of specialist bees because some bees need certain flowers to survive. They just have certain food requirements. And in the case of specialist bees, the female bees collect pollen from a certain subset of plants because that's the only pollen sources that their young can survive on. Um, they might collect pollen only from, in very rare cases, just one species of plant, but more frequently from a genus of plants or from a whole family of plants. Um, so some examples of plants that support uh, specialist bees include sunflowers, ironweed, asters, willows, globe mallow, uh, blueberries, squash, and there's many more as well. And some examples of some specialist bees that you could find in your yard include um, the sunflower longhorned bee on the left here. That's uh, a bee in the genus Sphastra that collects pollen from helianthus sunflowers and closely related species like um, false sunflower, which is what the bee is pictured on here. And then on the right, these are squash bees in the genus Pepinapus. And these bees only collect pollen from um, cucurbita, squash plants. And um, their life cycle is so closely tied to them that they, the females often build nests underneath squash so that when they're young emerge the following year, they're more likely to find squash plants. And the females are the first visitors in the morning when that squash flower opens up. And sometimes even the males will crawl in there during the nighttime to wait for the females so they can mate right away um, because the life cycle is so closely tied to this plant. Bees are not the only um, picky that have specific needs out there. Um, many butterflies and moths also have specific host plant needs for their caterpillars. 
Um, for example, um, monarch caterpillars are obligates on uh, milkweeds, plants in the genus Asclepius, and rely on milkweeds as, as their food sources. Um, so if you're looking to support a particular butterfly or moth species, it's important to um, include their host plant. And including their host plants often has many other benefits. Like in the case of milkweeds, they're beautiful and they also provide a lot of high quality nectar for a wide range of insects. Another element of plant selection is including grasses and sedges. And these are important to include because they can be host plants for many Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths. They can also be overwintering sites for butterflies, moths, beetles, and flies. And um, the, the thatch that can form and the root systems of some budge grasses can be nesting sites for colonies of bumblebees as well. So they have an important role in the landscape. And another element of plant selection is to think about plants that can provide nesting materials for bees and solitary wasps. Uh, about 30% of um, native bees in the United States nest in tunnels, often wood tunnels, like hollow stems or pithy plants that they excavate. Um, and there are a number of native plants that provide important nesting materials for these tunnel nesting bees, such as raspberries, caneberries, wild rose, um, sumac, herbaceous plants like sunflowers um, and um, beard tongue, penstemon, and, and many others. And one last element of plant selection is to select plants that are bee safe. Um, and in this case, bee safe means um, protected from pesticides. Uh, bees can be exposed to harmful pesticides um, if the plants that you purchase at a nursery had applications of systemic insecticides during the commercial nursery production process. And at the time of sale, some of those plants can still contain residues. And even at small levels, those residues of um, systemic insecticides like neonicotinoids can be harmful to bees and butterflies. So although you aren't yourself applying the pesticide to that plant or to your habitat, your pollinators are still exposed to that chemical. So it's really important when you're selecting plants to start a conversation with your, um, with your nursery about the pesticides that are used on your plants. And this, this might feel awkward, um, but it really is important and it can be a good way to signal to um, your plant providers that this is an important thing that consumers care about. Um, in fact, my neighbor next door um, made quite a lot of effort to, to talk with our, our local nursery just down the road about this and um, was told that they'd heard about it so much that they had stopped using neonicotinoids, which is a, a pretty big step. So to summarize, if you're thinking, oh my gosh, there's so much that goes into plant selection. You know, I need to focus on natives. I need to make sure they're appropriate for my site. I need to make sure there's something blooming all the time. I've got to support specialist bees and host plants for butterflies and nesting materials, where in the world am I gonna find all that information? Um, the good news is that Circe's does have plant lists that highlight really high value pollinator plants. And we have new plant lists that are coming very soon that include all this information about specialist bees and host plants and nesting materials, all in just really easy to use lists that include attributes of plants like sun and soil needs. So um, that is coming soon. One last thing before we move on to the design stage is it can be really helpful to assess your site to, to help you evaluate the habitat that you have and think through what you could add to your landscape to improve it for pollinators. Um, we have a habitat assessment guide for yards, gardens, or parks. And um, this is a really easy tool to use. You download it and you can um, score different parts of your landscape for um, different bloom periods, for different nesting resources for um, your pesticide practices and, and also how you communicate within your community. And this scoring process can help you rank some of the options that you uh, might wanna take. All right. So in the design process, there are a couple things to consider. First of all, if you're feeling um, really overwhelmed, you can start out small. You can start 
this by planting a few plants and that's totally fine. And then think about expanding it the next year if you'd like. Um, this is a garden that my colleague Emily May started um, at one of the houses that she lived in and just added to it every single year. It can be important to cluster plants together um, in small spaces in particular to help make them more visible and also for visual attractiveness. Uh, also, when planting native plants, uh, unlike vegetable plants, you, know, you don't really want to plant in straight lines or sharp corners. Uh, it's really, um, it's fine to, to be less planned in that aspect of the design. And then um, a really important consideration are layers and thinking about how taller species impact shorter species. So layering plants just means starting by thinking about your design with the tallest plant in the area. So if you've got a really tall tree that provides some shade, um, you'd think about planting some shorter trees and shrubs underneath that taller tree so that you have um, an understory underneath that overstory. And then under the, sh under the shrubs and trees, you can also add a ground layer of wildflowers and um, there are many native woodland wildflowers and shrubs that bloom early to avoid being shaded out from the overstory. Um, others tolerate shade or filtered sunlight. So these plants are really adapted for layering. It's a really great way to fit in um, a lot more biodiversity in um, more spaces. If you're working in the sunny site, then your taller plant might be um, quite a tall herbaceous species or tall grasses. And um, you design your plants around that, making sure that you've got plants that are low growing that can fill in in the understory, again, underneath those herbaceous plants. And plant layers can help reduce water loss and prevent weed invasions and also can reduce the use of mulch. So there's a lot of advantages. Um, layers also work within containers and the same principle applies. You start with your tallest plant and then add plants of different heights around that tallest plant, including some ground covers that can spill over the side of the container. Um, tall plants can be used strategically as well. Um, you could use, in this case, this is Illinois rose bushes right here and um, giant vernonia and um, also Joe pieweed that are up against a, a fence to shield and screen my backyard. Uh, and then quite a lot of different species that are much shorter um, underneath. All right, once you've got your plants in your design, you're ready to go. The first step of installation is to prepare the site. And preparing the site means to reduce weeds and existing vegetation so that you can reduce competition for the things that you're gonna plant that you want to survive. So if your site is really weedy, it can require a little bit more site preparation to, to knock back those existing plants and weeds. Um, but if you're planting into turf, it's a really quick process. Um, because turf has reduced all the diversity already for you. <laughs> so all you need to do is remove the turf and turf has very short root systems. So it can be as easy as digging um, underneath really quickly. Um, I also like to use a soil knife uh, rather than a shovel sometimes because you can just slice through the root systems and pull up the turf. But if you don't want to dig, you could use an approach called sheet mulching, which is layering cardboard, and um, other plant material like compost or straw on top of that, um, that smothers the grass. And you can also plant directly into that, that layer. Um, another alternative is to use um, herbicide applications, which might be really helpful if you're working in a space with lots and lots of weeds. And then you can plant directly into that, um, into that area. It can be important to plant in the spring or the late summer. That's often when you have more moisture for those plants, which is really helpful for establishment. Um, and it, even if you're planting in areas that get quite a lot of rainfall, sometimes it can be important to supplement with a little bit of watering uh, because most plants, even those that are well adapted to dry conditions, need a little bit of moisture in the first year or two to help get established well. Uh, if you're a container gardener, make sure you're using potting soil, anything to help increase the drainage within that container so that the root systems are really healthy and um, make sure there's lots of holes at the bottom of the container. After installation, you can enjoy the 
enjoy what arrives. I think the amazing thing about gardens is they are never the same <laughs> from year after year. They're always changing based on weather conditions and other things. So it's really fun to get to watch them over time. Um, but it can be helpful to keep records of what you plant and where you plant it um, so that you can, you can see how it changes over time and adapt if you need to. So for example, if you were like me and you put some full sun plants in some partial shade and they did not do well, you could move them. Um, you don't need to be afraid to move plants if they aren't flourishing, find a new place for them. Or also in my case, if the tree that you built your garden bed around, this redbud tree pictured here, um, died suddenly as it did this year, perhaps due to some extended dryness we had over the winter and the fall, um, then you need to think about relocating all the shade tolerant plants underneath that are now exposed to full sun. <laughs> um, so adapting over time is a, is, a, is a part of gardening and can be really um, both rewarding and frustrating. Um, some plants will move over time. So in this case, all these plants seen here on the, in the corner of this image in between the sidewalk and the street along the curb, all these plants migrated in via seed from our planting um, up the slope. Um, this was just really poor soil where turf didn't establish after a sewer construction project, but the native plants just took off and completely grew there when nothing else could. So um, native plants will find a way. Um, they may not also stay where you put them. So in this case, this picture shows really tall cut plants and um, uh, common milkweed, which were not planted right around the corner of the, the deck, right over the pathway, um, but migrated five to eight to 10 feet away from there were planted uh, to the spot where their conditions were much more um, amenable for them. So in that case, you have to adapt <laughs> and cut them back or um, deadhead them if they're prolific seeders, or collect their seeds and share, um, but don't be afraid to trim back plants if they're not where you want them to be. Another important component of maintenance is to uh, protect overwintering sites and nesting sites. Um, overwintering sites for a lot of butterflies, moths, beetles, and flies can be the leaf layer litter. Um, so this can mean um, leaving your leaves in the fall, piling up on, the, on your garden um, or piling them up under trees or shrubs so that they are available for these critters to, to overwinter in and take shelter in. And saving the stems means leaving the stems from your um, woody plants and some of your herbaceous perennials as well. And then uh, leaving quite a lot of growth in the spring as well, cutting them back to six to eight to 10 to 12 inches in height so that bees can use that old growth of stems for nests in the current year. And protection from pesticides is the last aspect of maintenance. All these things that we've been talking about uh, using a diversity of native plant species and um, uh, thinking through native plants and putting the plants where they're going to be most successful is going to create a really resilient landscape. So um, you're much less likely to have pest outbreaks in that type of landscape. Um, but if you do have a pest problem, it's important to think through if it actually is a pest problem. Perhaps it's just an insect that you want in your yard eating the plant, which is doing its job. Uh, if you've got something munching on your plants, you have life and that is wonderful. Um, if you have a pest that's compromising the health of your plant, that's another thing. In that case, it's important to confirm the identification of that pest, reach out to extension services or to a plant diagnostic helpline, um, and then think through whether or not you need to use an insecticide to control that pest. And if you do need to use insecticides, reduce the risk to pollinators by avoiding spraying the flowers. Just treat the plant that has the pest problem and use products that are least toxic to pollinators. Um, planting habitat for pollinators has multiple benefits uh, to a wide range of wildlife. Um, and one of them is that it supports this huge diversity of predatory and parasitic insects that can help um, provide natural biological control of ornamental and crop pests. So um, if you're 
if you're planting for pollinators, there's already this support system in place to help suppress pests without the use of pesticides. And lastly, this is um, the yard of one of my colleagues, Jessa, who lives in California. And she transformed her yard from um, turf to pollinator habitat. And, and um, this is particularly beneficial uh, because of all the droughts that California has faced and um, the need to reduce water and so forth. But also, of course, um, she loves having pollinators come to her habitat. So we've talked about ways to include um, plenty of flowering plants in your landscape. Um, and I touched just really briefly on the need to protect that habitat from pesticides and um, include habitat for nesting and overwintering. But the last component of our Bring Back the Pollinators Pledge is to spread the word. And this is particularly important because this helps you showcase the things that you do, um, whether you do this through signage or you share plants with others in your community, this is just a wonderful way to, um, to build support for pollinators, um, to share the steps that others can do, and really just create more space in your community for pollinators. Uh, one way you can step up in your community and increase involvement is to get involved in um, a B City USA or B Campus USA certification. Um, you can find out more um, uh, at our website about B City USA and B Campus USA. And scaling up all these efforts in your community are important um, because these places where we live, work, and play have to absolutely have to support biodiversity, or <laughs> our systems are going to start to fall apart. Um, so share plants with your neighbors, connect your municipality ask them what they're doing, um, what their practices are for using native plants and landscapes or plant management or pest management. Um, think about adopting a park or a boulevard. Um, all those kinds of things can make a difference to incorporating um, native plants into the places where we live and work um, and play like universities and parks and city downtown plantings and K through 12 schools or in cities to help reduce stormwater runoff uh, to capture water um, before it, it needs to reach um, any system. So to capture it in, in, in habitat. All right, so to wrap up, um, as Rachel mentioned, this is the first of four webinars in our Bring Back the Pollinators webinar series. So in a month, there'll be um, another webinar focusing on avoiding pesticides, and then in August, um, per, uh, excuse me, in August, it's about spreading the words, and then in September, it's providing nesting sites. To end up, I want to just share a couple of resources. Um, Circe's has books available um, with all sorts of information about pollinators and pollinator habitat. We also have a ton of resources that are available for downloading for free, um, including a fact sheet on nesting overwintering and by Be Safe Plants. We have plenty of information about plant selection on our website through our Pollinator Conservation Resource Center. Um, if you'd like more specific information about monarch nectar plants, for example, or milkweeds that are common in regions, um, we have information specifically about monarchs as well. Um, this presentation and also others are available on our Xerces Society YouTube channel. There's a lot to watch there if you have some time. And lastly, I want to thank um, our donors in particular. We're a donor supported nonprofit. Their work goes directly to our conservation, it just goes directly to support our conservation actions. So we're really thankful for our donors. And if you are interested in becoming a donor or um, you want to learn more about giving, you can visit our, our website. Um, donations can come with a habitat sign and a, a year of membership to Circe's. All the work that Xerces does um, happens because of our members, but also because of our funders, um, as well as the, the scientists that we learn from, um, the agencies that we work with at local, state, and federal levels, all of the land managers and farmers that work with us on habitat projects to help us learn more, um, and then all the people 
as well that are involved in our community science initiatives. So thank you so much to all the people out there that are doing so much good conservation work. And lastly, um, gardening is something that brings me great joy and I hope brings you so much joy as well. Uh, but it's important to remember that everything we do in our spaces has um, implications beyond our spaces. All the value of our gardens can overflow into the landscape around it. And um, your space can be part of um, slowing the declines of the animals that we depend on for so much. That's it. So thank you, thank you so much. I'm happy to take questions. Um, and Rachel, if, if you wanna go over to, I'm happy to do that to answer questions. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Yeah, we'll definitely um, we have a few good questions here, so keep them coming. If anyone has them, use the Q&A icon. We've gotten a lot of great feedback just thanking you for this presentation. I shouldn't say this because I work for Xerxes, but I am a horrible gardener, and I feel like you <laughs> offered so many practical first steps that I've been missing, so I'm excited to now implement those because it can be discouraging when you just have a black thumb <laughs> and people you work with are these just incredible um, gardeners. So it was very inspiring. And thank you for that, that information. It was so helpful. Yeah, I hope everybody can learn from my mistakes because I have made a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have a few questions here. One from Karina, hello, Karina. Um, does the term heirloom on a seed packet mean straight native or is there another way to ensure that they are not purchasing cultivar species? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, Karina, it's a, it usually heirloom refers to um, non-native species or um, food garden species. And heirloom really means it's got some connection to our history. Um, it's a variety that was bred quite a long time ago that people have found really useful or have a cultural connection to. So um, it might be a particular bean species that somebody carried with them on the organ trail or, or something that um, has, that was bred for showiness um, or taste or something more. So usually it applies to garden plants like cosmos or um, uh, heirloom varieties of squash or pumpkins or that type of thing. So if you're thinking about native plants, um, when you look at the tag, there will be the species name and then there, there often is a little like a VAR and then it'll have a secondary name that goes along with that and that will tell you the variety. Um, also the best way to ensure that you get straight natives is just to go to straight to a native um, plant nursery. And I did forget to mention this, but in our Pollinator Conservation Resource Center, we have a list of, of native plant providers that can, um, that can tell you if they're not selling directly out of their nursery, they can tell you where they provide their plants, where you can purchase them. So that's a great resource. And thanks for that question. That doesn't mean their heirlooms are bad, they're wonderful. Yeah, and they can be totally valuable for pollinators. It's just that they aren't typically native species. All right, and I'll get that link to the Pollinator Conservation Resource Center in the chat here in just a minute. Um, Kathy is wondering for squash bees, what is a native squash? Well, yeah, well, actually squash are native to um, North America. Um, so anything like uh, pumpkins, um, butternut squash, uh, zucchini, uh, what am I forgetting? Um, buttercup squash. I think those are the four species of squash. Anything in the genus cucurbita, that's all native. They've certainly been bred, um, but that's, that's just part of um, gardening. Um, Yes, I should have mentioned that with Karina's questions too. Yeah, we have plenty of um, crop species that are native to the US like corn and, and squash and so forth. <clears throat> yeah, so squash bees love squash. There are some wild squash and I'm sorry if that was the question and I just got off on my tangent thinking about um, crop squash, but there are a couple of species of native cucurbita. But interestingly, um, when uh, Native Americans spread throughout North America, they uh, initiated the spread of, of wild squash uh, as they cultivated it, as they moved around. And um, it's hypothesized that the squash bees moved with them as the as squash expanded in the landscape. So 
All right, thank you. Kathy also lives near Blair, Nebraska, and is wondering what the name of that nursery is that banned neonics. Oh yeah, actually I don't have that information off the top of my head. I'm really sorry. They were based in Iowa because the plant provider down the road from me gets their plants from Iowa. Um, and a lot of them are varieties. <laughs> but if you're looking for um, native plants here in Nebraska, we have a native plant producers organization um, that I can um, find the link for and hopefully put in the chat in just a minute if you need to, or you can Google Nebraska native plant producers and find that. And then you can find nurseries where they have plants or there's a couple producers that will mail you plants too. That's great, they went right to the source. <laughs> So I really like this question, um, Shira, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, she's asking for people who would be totally new for this and hard to turn towards like family, friends, neighbors, what yeah. would you say is a good first step that would feel accessible as a starting point and have greatest impact? I love this question. <laughs> yeah, what a great question. Um, I think I would start with um, maybe a small, just select um, few native plants to put um, something that's going to be really showy and beautiful, um, something that's really attractive to pollinators and something that's really easy to grow. And um, I would maybe offer to plant those for them so they don't have to stress about it <laughs> and you can find the right place for it. And um, hopefully I think, you know, just the power of watching things come to that plant and it might be enough to convert them. Um, I have had neighbors who walk by and I should in all full disclosure say that sometimes my garden gets really messy because some of, sometimes it's gotten out of control. And so um, sometimes when they walk by, I worry about it. And um, I've had neighbors that walk by though and have asked for seeds for different plants or transplants. Um, and oftentimes they'll say it's because they saw goldfinches feeding on the echinacea seeds or um, monarchs in the garden or something like that. So I think that power of seeing life and hearing life um, can, can change minds. So I might, I would, I would start small. If you have the ability to help them, that's where I would start. A great question though. I think I'm gonna think about that a lot more and come up with some other solutions later on too, because that's a, it's a multi-layered question. Thank you. So Mary is wondering, they live in a newly built house in North Carolina. They have heavy clay soil. Soil testing showed a good level of nitrogen, but the organic matter in the soil was measured at 0 0.01. <laughs> what will grow well and benefit their pollinators while they increase, while they work on increasing the organic matter in their garden? Yeah, great question. Um, so the one thing about native plants is they actually like conditions that are a little bit less fertile. So if you have um, if you have really high nitrogen levels, I think you want to add organic matter first before you add plants because adding organic matter can draw out that nitrogen or you could start with grasses or something like native grasses that would pull up a lot of that nitrogen and use it and then you could add in wildflowers. So that's one way to go. Um, I have a colleague who lives in Oklahoma, Ray Morans, who also has really heavy clay soils. And what he did um, was he did sort of a variation of sheet mulching, but without smothering the ground. Um, and it layered compost and straw and other um, organic materials on top of his soil. And then he planted just directly into that. And eventually over time, that bed broke down and really helped to benefit the soil. So that's um, one method that he tried that was successful for him. So that's two different options there, but I guess I would just be a little cautious to planting into soil that's got lots of nitrogen in it right away. Um, might be good to incorporate some more organic material first. But on the other hand, um, native plants can do well in really poor soils. <laughs> so you could just start out small and just see um, what takes. All right, so this next question, there's a few questions within it. <laughs> Amy is asking, they have heard so many suggestions off acre pasture into pollinator habitat. What do you see as the best way to tamp down the existing grasses and non-desirables 
and what is the best time to sow seeds fall or spring. They also asked, is using an herbicide to assist in getting rid of the turf grass a bad idea? What do you think about till versus no till to prepare the planting? Okay. Um, unfortunately, my microphone kind of cut out for the first half of the question. Could you repeat the first portion first? Yes, definitely. So they are converting a large half area acre of pasture from grass to pollinator habitat. And they want to know the best way to tamp down the existing grasses and non-desirables and what is the best time to sow seeds. Okay, yeah, that's a great question. We do have a lot of resources for um, larger scale habitat conversion on our website. Um, we have a document that's devoted to um, organic site preparation. So if you are interested in pursuing organic site preparation, we list a whole bunch of different resources and options for that. Um, otherwise, we also have a document about habitat installation and um, the general approach in that is to use herbicides to kill out existing vegetation. But I think that um, it kind of depends too on the quality of the existing vegetation. If you've got some beneficial plants that you're wanting to maintain versus you're just looking to get rid of the whole thing and start from scratch, then your approach changes a little bit. Um, so if you're looking to start from scratch, check out our installation guide or habit or our organic site prep. If you're looking to keep some of the existing vegetation, we have an interseeding guide um, that provides some guidance on suppressing existing vegetation long enough to get new species established. So you're not eradicating everything that's there, but you're just pushing it back so that new things can, can fill in. Um, so that's also available on our website. And um, one thing about tillage, you mentioned tillage, that's definitely um, a site prep approach that can be uh, successful. You need to till usually multiple times because tilling disturbs the seed bank and then you have weeds that crop up. So then you till again to suppress it or, um, and then they crop up again. And eventually, you know, you've, you've run through the seed bank. Um, so if you choose to go that route, that's important to think about that you'll, you'll need to do it more than once. But if you're using another site prep map, method, for example, like herbicide spraying, at that point, um, you want to disturb the soil as little as possible uh, so that you don't bring new, new seeds to the surface. Okay, that was a lot of layers. Did I get them all? Yes, that was great. <laughs> it's a lot of, it's a lot of questions, but I think it's yeah, easier to able to answer. <laughs> Joanne is asking, could you talk about mulch? Are there some that are more beneficial to pollinators? Yeah, this is a tough question. Um, there isn't science to guide this. Um, I think the thing is about mulch is that it creates a layer on the soil and that can be beneficial in some ways because it reduces uh, moisture loss. Um, but in other ways it can be somewhat problematic because Bees, for example, need access to the ground in order to ground nesting bees in order to build their nest. So if you have a really thick layer of bark mulch, um, then that can restrict their ability to build nests in your soil. And certainly if you have plastic mulch, that will absolutely, or other plant barriers will absolutely um, take away their nesting opportunities. So if you're going to use mulch, um, it's good to use it um, fairly lightly uh, to spread it out, which I realize isn't always ideal when you're uh, in certain landscapes. Um, so you might clump the mulch right around the base of the plant, for example, and then um, lightly use it outside of that so that there's plenty of places where bees can access it. Um, otherwise, uh, there is no rule that says you have to use mulch. If you want to, you could use layers of plants to fill in underneath. So um, if you've got just a small herbaceous bed, sometimes you can find some low growing ground covers that fill in underneath the, the slightly taller herbaceous plants. Um, in my yard, that's purple poppy mallow, which is a, or also known as wine cup, um, which is just a real uh, low growing plant that, that just spreads underneath and spreads and it doesn't dominate or anything or, um, knock back anything, it just fills in the gaps. So something like that would be ideal so that you could use less mulch if you needed to. 
but if you if you need to use mulch, just go light in some places so there's access to the soil. Mm -hmm. um, but plastic mulch is out and um, rock mulch is okay. There are actually some bees that prefer to nest in in like a rock soil matrix. So. Great, thank you. We have a couple of people asking kind of the human dimensions part of pollinator conservation. Um, Kathy's just saying that they're having trouble explaining to people who don't really seem to care about the importance of the systems that will fall apart without pollinators and how that really affects humans. And is there more than just crops not being pollinated that will have an impact on us? And we have another question that's somewhat similar. Um, pardon me, I just lost it. Um, from Shira about words of wisdom for people who are not connected to the goodness of insects to help really want them around. Yeah, these are great questions. And um, I think it's it's hard because I, I think that indicates how, how much we've sort of veered away from our connection to nature, you know, um, in general as a society. Um, uh, but to address the first question, question and I, I guess part of the second question too um, I think highlighting um, the, the other impacts that pollinators have aside from food production I know food production of, of in and of itself is also separated from people you know we go to the grocery store and we find food and we just have totally forgotten how it's produced or just don't know that much about how it's produced um, so that can feel a little bit less um, urgent for some people, but for others, you know, they, they hear that, oh, coffee is bee pollinated, that coffee is essential to their well-being every day, so that can make an impact. Um, and sometimes it can just be sharing a couple of these other, you know, these, these factoids that can, to find the one that really resonates with somebody. So I mentioned that some people in my community have really been connected to birds, um, and recognizing that pollinators are essential to birds is one way to make a connection. Um, of course, without pollinators, we wouldn't have seeds and fruits and birds wouldn't have those food sources, um, let alone uh, the caterpillars and other insects to feed their young. Um, so if, you, if, if you've got a birder in your life or anybody who enjoys a bird feeder, pollinators are really a key component of that. Um, they're just a key component of healthy systems in general. You know, it's it's much harder to link them to um, clean water, but um, because we're so disassociated from clean water as well, um, but they're a part of clean water because the root systems of these plants that depend on pollinators are important in filtering out um, nutrients and allowing water to infiltrate and so much more. So gosh, I mean, pollinators are really kind of at a hub um, in our lives. So um, oh, yeah, I'm maybe not, I wonder if some of those head arguments just aren't as much as um, like some of the, heart, like a heart argument, like um, saying, if you really like pizza, for example, you really need bees. <laughs> um, pizza and bees go together because you couldn't have tomatoes without bees and you couldn't really even have, you couldn't have basil or broccoli or anything else on your pizza, or you couldn't have, um, even cheese has a link to bees because many dairy cattle rely on plants that are pollinated by bees. So that might be another way to go, make it really concrete. I don't know if that helps entirely. Um, and then I'm so sorry, but the second part of that question, I think has escaped my mind. Oh yes, let me find it again. I think it, I mean, it's somewhat similar, just words of wisdom for people who aren't really connected to the goodness of insects to help them want them around. I think it's kind of that same, that same issue. How do you get people to love insects when they're kind of trained to not love them? <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, one good statistic to keep in your brain is that only 2% of all insect species are considered to be pests. And you know, the pest definition is pretty broad, but it encompasses things that are a nuisance that cause disease and that um, hurt our crops. And even all those pests are just a small fraction of insect life. The rest are beneficial to people or beneficial to ecosystems. So it's huge diversity out there that 
we literally depend on. <laughs> um, so hopefully that helps put it in perspective, but what that really means in their life is they're more often encountering species that are not pests, that are totally benign. So hopefully that will help them rethink what they're looking at, you know, think about this isn't actually a threat to me. This is something that's um, part of the just part of the world. Um. Yeah, definitely. No, I think those are great suggestions. I often try to think of the step beyond just the insect itself, like fishermen, for example. Yeah. You know, all fish species depend on insect at some insects at some point in their life cycle. And I like the example of grizzly bears in Yellowstone. I mean, that's such an iconic species in an iconic national park. They eat hundreds of thousands of miller moths every season, you know, so there's kind of this disconnect for their, their benefit beyond just pollinating food for us too. Yeah, that's excellent, Rachel. So we're shifting a little bit um, on regarding specialist bees and native plant lists. This person is asking if we have any a comprehensive list of what specialist bees will be on what plant, or are they just called like the aster bee, the willer, um, willow bee? Do we have any resources that kind of address that? Specialist? Yeah, we don't have existing resources for specialist bees, but there are. There's a website out there from um, a former Zerci employee actually who collated. Um, what we know of specialist bees and the plants that they can be found on. So um, his name is Jared Fowler, and I will see if I can pop that link into the, um, in the, to the chat box. But if you search for Jared Fowler specialist bees, it'll bring up lists of bees by region. And so that will provide a list of uh, plant genera of bees that, that can be found on certain plants. Um, and I think it's good to know that uh, not all these bees have common names. So um, some of them, we don't know much about them. And there are probably a ton of species out there that, that we don't necessarily know their floral relationship yet to. Um, but most bees are generalists. I think about two thirds of them are generalists. It varies depending on where you are in the United States. Um, if you live in the desert Southwest, Maybe, maybe it's closer to 50% of species that are specialist. So um, it definitely varies. Um, and it's great to provide um, a diversity of native plants whenever you can, because usually there's, um, you know, if you're including some of the really good pollinator plants, you're gonna be supporting specialist bees um, of some sort. All right, we have two more questions. Time for two more questions. Um, one person, um, Paula has a specific question about ironweed and they're wondering if they can plant ironweed seed inside the house now for planting outside in fall. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and then I like this question because it has to do with earthworms. <laughs> Oscar has a lot of earthworms, um, night crawlers mostly in both their front and backyards. Are there any sorts of plants that specifically benefit from those sorts of species in the soil? Uh, gosh, earthworms is actually a tricky, a tricky deal um, because it, it, it definitely depends on where you are. Um, in general, earthworms can be really um, beneficial. They turn over the soil a lot and they spread nutrients in the soil. So in a garden setting, they can be great. Um, but a large majority of the earthworms in the United States are actually introduced species. Um, in fact, if you live in the central portion of the country, <laughs> um, our earthworms, native earthworms were, were um, removed during the last glaciation event. So um, native earthworms in the United States are really just restricted to the Pacific Northwest and to a little bit in the Northeast. Um, so a lot of those species in between are non-native and there are a couple non-native earthworms that are really problematic that have started to spread and become invasive. So it is important to be aware of those. Those are called um, jumping worms. And um, the way you can tell the difference between jumping worms and the more familiar night crawlers, um, which are also introduced is um, jumping worms start to, they really just move quite a lot. They also have that band 
the smooth band that goes around their body that's closest to their head um, that's white instead of more dark. So that's another way to tell them apart. Um, but they just look like they just crazy twitch. Um, so if you've got those worms in your garden, it's really important to be careful not to spread them. So when you share plants, just make sure there's not any worms in them. Um, so I guess the answer to the question is it depends on where you are and it depends on the worm. <laughs> but no, earthworms don't really, um, as far as I know, they don't have as much connection to above ground habitat um, as below. Um, with the only exception being that some of these invasive worms really flourish in um, wooded sites. And that's a real problem because they'll eat through the leaf litter that is habitat for um, birds and um, small mammals and reptiles and amphibians and so forth. So it's really been a problem um, in some of those areas. So yeah, earthworms, mixed bag. <laughs> Thank you for answering that. I think it's helpful. 